Welcome to the Jacob Edwards Library and our presentation this evening. Um, we're delighted that you'd come out on another cold night and it's wonderful to think that the topic, which is of great interest to all of us, uh, that so many of you were here to be here and present. But as you know, we're recording as well for uh, YouTube. So uh, thanks to our colleagues at the Southbridge Cable TV station who assist with that. Um, thanks to the Friends of the Library for um, supporting our programs and for also providing um, complimentary uh, beverages this evening. So let's move on to our talk. So many of you were here in way before time, which is a very good sign. So uh, we have Dr. Robert Jagir here from um, Worcester Public, uh, excuse me, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and we are delighted to welcome here to Southbridge. And uh, I had the pleasure of hearing this talk and a similar talk uh, earlier, and I believe there's newer data and a lot more exciting results. Um, I had been at Tower Hill, and I thought it was very impressive, and um, as so much of it went over my head, I'm glad that I am here to get another uh, review as well. So with great uh, anticipation, we let's welcome Dr. Jagir to the book. Be here. Um, I'm also a uh, director of the Lindy Ecology Project, so it's a citizen science project that I started a couple of years ago. I'm hoping uh, some of you will be interested in, in joining the project, so I'll talk about that uh, near the end of my talk. So, my a couple things that I want to accomplish today, um, you can tell by the title, I'm humming a different tune, ecological approach. Um, that implies that we are humming a tune and there's another one out there. So I'm going to be talking about the, what I call the two faces of, of pollinator decline. One of the faces has had a considerable amount of a, attention. That's both in terms of um, public awareness and, and uh, research funding. And the other side is virtually being neglected. And, and both sides of, of the pollinator decline issue are, are extremely important to us. Um, and so I'm. Hopefully you'll leave here today with an understanding, at least of both sides, why they're important. Um, the other thing I hope to accomplish today is, is to give you some, some practical um, information. So, you know, I, I get asked, um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what do I put in my garden, what do I need to do um, to help um, native pollinator diversity? And so I have, you know, I'll talk about that, things you need to think about. I also have some handouts, plant lists that you can select from, and I'll, I'll teach you how to choose plants for your yard. Um, I also have a handout on bumblebees, so we focus primarily on bumblebees today. Talk about what those are and how many species you should be seeing in your backyard and I'll give you an ID sheet. We also have an Android and an iPhone um, web app um, as part of this ecology project to help you to collect data from your own backyard and it gets sent to us um, at WPI and then you can either look at the, you know, this is across Massachusetts, you can either look at other people's data or um, you know, it's, it's going to help me with the research so we can figure out what's going on with, with uh, the pollinators. So a brief overview, uh, I'm going to start as I mentioned by talking about the two faces and then I'm going to go in and talk about what I call ecological pollinator conservation, what that means, um, how we have to sort of change the way we think about pollinators, uh, bees in particular. Uh, and then the what can I do part, I'll talk a bit about the ecology project and then you know, I'll finish with, with a checklist, sort of summing up everything that I, I talked about, the checklist, so that you can look at your own habitat. It could be a garden, it could be um, conservation land, at any spatial scale, you should be able to look at and assess the pollinator friendliness of your, of your um, habitat. So, as I mentioned, there are two issues going on with, with pollinator decline, and it's sort of morphed into, into one issue, and it's, it's heavily biased in one direction. So. There, there are two things going on. The first is that, um, and I'm sure that this is the one that most of you are aware of, that there's um, been um, an increase in colony loss in honeybees, and this started with what is, was termed colony collapse disorder in around 2006. Um, and so what happened was beekeepers started to notice that um, in the spring, when they opened up their hives, the hive is empty. So there are no bees, no dead bees observed anywhere, it's just the queen and a few, a few workers. Um, and, and so colony collapse, to some extent, is, is currently an issue, but there, I just want you to be aware that, that colony loss has increased for other reasons. And so there's, you know, people have really, especially with the pesticides, they really harped on, do pesticides cause, cause, cause colony collapse? That means you have the symptoms of colony collapse, but they could be causing colony loss 
um, and it's just not, it's still a negative thing, right? It's still affecting bee health. So, you know, honeybee health is, um, is, is um, honeybees are in trouble. And I'll talk about the implications um, of that. On the other side, um, we also have a number of native wild pollinator species in decline. So um, the three shown here are bumblebee species that we should see they're native to Massachusetts, Eastern North America. Bombus affinus was uh, put on the endangered species list, the first bumblebee to be listed um, January of last year. Um, Bombus fervidus shown here and Bombus um, tricola. Um, both, all three of these were uh, extremely abundant um, a couple of decades ago in this area. Uh, since that time, this one's nowhere to be found. A few of these um, are, are north of here in heat, and um, a few of these around, but they're in serious trouble. In addition, the monarch butterfly, uh, which is another important pollinator, um, when we start talking about ecological perspectives, you'll see why. Um, it's been in decline for the last few years as well, so it's in trouble as well. So what I want to point out here is that when we talk about colony collapse soar and honeybees, we're talking about one species, and it's a non-native species. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, when we talk about our native pollinator decline, we're talking about many species, okay? And those are just the ones that we know about. So if we look at our native pollinators, and we just, um, well, before I get there, I was uh, presenting at the State House. Uh, so there's a pesticide bill that Representative Dykema is, is putting through, and I was talking about some of my research, and um, there was public discussion or public questions after. And, and I got the sense, well, somebody said that, you know, there's no evidence that, that bees are in decline in Massachusetts. There's no evidence that there's a problem. And so what we did was we've been intensively surveying areas around Massachusetts for the past three years, uh, that myself and uh, my graduate students and uh, undergraduate volunteers. And if we look at Massachusetts, you know, we have uh, elevation changes. And if we look at the, the, the wild bee diversity, bumblebees, those are the black and yellow fuzzy ones. Um, they, they, they sort of separate out uh, below 1,000 feet and above 1,000 feet. So we surveyed areas that were below 1,000 and above 1,000. Yeah. And so uh, the good thing about Mass, one of the many good things about Massachusetts is we had naturalists um, in the mid 80s that were really interested in the, um, in the uh, insect diversity. And they intensively surveyed areas. So we have really good historic uh, bumblebee data which species were around, how abundant they were for these different areas. And they're shown in the blue bars here. Might be difficult for some of you to see. Down here we have all of the bumblebee species. So historically we've had 11, we had, had 11 bumblebee species in Massachusetts. Um, there are 50 bumblebee species total in North America, 25 east, 25 west. In, our, in Massachusetts there have been 11. If we go farther north, you know, that number increases as we go north. Um, so um, in the blue, the blue bars are showing historical data, and you can see that uh, many of the species are um, in uh, far less abundant than they were. Some of them we didn't find. Bombus aphanus is one of the endangered species list. Bombus bagans is in serious trouble, and this is this is occurring both at the low and high elevation. Um, and so it's it's very clear. Um, and I've been studying bumblebees for over 20 years now. Um, and I watched the declines happen. So Bombus aphanus, the one on the endangered species list, was a nuisance to, my, uh, to me uh, during my gra graduate days um, because uh, what Bombus aphanus does is it bites holes in flowers. And I was trying to find intact flowers because I was studying you know, how bees respond and learn different flower shapes. And so Bombus aphanus is a nectar robber, so is Bombus tricola, uh, and I couldn't find a flower without a hole in it. Five years later, I couldn't find a hole anywhere, and I couldn't find a bombus aphnus anywhere. So that's how, and I'm talking, you know, originally I'm, uh, this research was done in Canada, um, we're talking about something like Ontario, we couldn't find it, Ontario-wide, which is like statewide. Um, so we were seeing these very rapid and dramatic declines, and we knew all of this was going on years before colony collapse disorder. And there were probably two or three other people like me that were made, giving these same talks We've got to do something, we've got to do something, and nobody listened until the honeybee and colony collapse disorder hit the public's attention, and now everybody cares about bees. The problem, and so 
The colony collapse is a negative thing, but it was good because at least wild bees were getting recognized. But now we still have this this heavy bias, and I'm trying to sort of pull it back and and, and balance balance things out a little bit. Um, so clearly there are declines in bumblebees. Now, as I said, when we talk about wild bees, there are 4,000 native bee species in North America alone. There are 2,000 bee species. The eastern, you can just divide it in half. So here are ex examples of different bee groups. So I talked about the bumblebees. There are 50 different species of bumblebee. And so when people think about bumblebees, they're like, oh, it's the, it's the same, it's one thing, but it's not. And again, that's because the honeybee is one thing. And there are races of honeybee, there could be the Italian, you know, they're from different places, but it's one species. Um, carpenter bees, they're the ones chewing holes in your deck. There are 33 different species of carpenter bee. Um, all of these are uh, important pollinators. They all uh, pollinate. The mining bees, these are the, and sweat bees, those are the small bees. These are beautiful bees, but they're, you know, a quarter of an inch. So, you know, unless you're looking at the flower, it's hard, hard to miss them. They're metallic green, metallic blue. Um, there's uh, megachylids. So those are just the bees, 630 species of these small bees, 520 of these beautiful metallic bees. Moss, 11,000 species. And, and you know, what gets lost here is that there are moth-pollinated native plants. So um, if we don't have moss, those plants aren't, uh, um, those moth-pollinated plants are, are, are going to decline as well. And so what we're seeing globally not just a decline in bumblebees globally, we're seeing a parallel decline in, in wild plants globally. And I'm gonna talk about the implications of that in a second. Butterflies, we know the monarch butterfly, there are 700 species of butterfly, um, and so on. Flies, um, you know, are really great pollinators, and there's some fly pollinated plants that, that bees won't touch because they just don't have the, the nectar um, rewards that the bees want. Beetles are important pollinators, and even wasps. They certainly don't have the pollination efficiency, so they're not transferring pollen as effectively as some of the bees, but they transfer pollen and our pollinators. The wasps often get confused with the bees because they have the same color pattern, and so the wasps are the ones that are bothering you at your picnic because not only do they visit flowers for nectar and pollen, they're also you know, in your trash, they're getting in your Coke can. Bees exclusively feed on floral nectar and pollen. All right? they're not, they don't care about what you're eating, so that's, you know, I get a bee in my bonnet when people in their yellow jackets <laughs> around and people are like, kill that bee. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's not a bee. Uh, it spoiled many picnics. Um, to put this in uh, perspective, again, so we're talking about one honeybee. And, and so when we think about conservation, currently, all of our conservation is focused on this. And the assumption is that this applies to the 10,000 other insects. And just looking at visually, here's the little tongue of the honeybee, and if you look at the tongue of a moth, there are differences, right? There, and if you look at the, the relationship between the flowers and the pollinators, there are connections. And this honey, the honeybee isn't a pollinator of anything. Um, sorry, I take that back. There are no honeybee pollinated native plants because it's a non-native species. And so we need to keep that in mind, that there's a relation, that not, when we talk about a native pollinator, there's a native plant that matches it. And I'll, talk, I'll show you data um, and sort of I'll talk about how to make that connection when you're planting your garden. What do we need to think about in terms of the flower, what it looks like, and um, you know when it blooms and things like that. So the other thing that I want to point out, the other aspect of this two faces idea, is the difference between a managed bee and a wild bee. So managed bees, honeybees, um, and we do have one managed um, native bee, native bumblebee species, Bombus impatiens. The managed bees, we take care of everything for them. We help them to mate, we give them food, we give them a house, we give them um, protection from disease. So, you know, if things, if, 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 if we don't have a lot of flowers in bloom, we just give them sugar water. And when the flowers come into bloom, we take away the sugar water and they go out. The wild bees and every other wild pollinator has to do all of that themselves. So if we look at our bumblebees, right now, our bumblebees are hibernating like a bear. They're in the, dug in the ground. They look like they're dead, but they have an antifreeze in them. They're, they can be super cool down close to freezing. Um, snow cover helps them to to um, helps to protect them from those extreme cold temperatures that we had them a few weeks ago. Um, in the spring, when when they warm up, the queens will emerge from their hibernation um, site and they'll go out and they'll start searching for a nest. So when you're out in the spring, you'll probably see bees that are around two inches. They could be up to two inches long. Some of the bumblebee queens. 
um, they're flying close to the ground, they're looking for a nest site. If they find a good nest site, then they'll go out and they'll start collecting nectar and pollen. So if you see a queen in the spring with pollen, you know it's found a nest. If you find to see a queen without pollen, then it's still looking. And that's a problem. If they don't have pollen, they haven't found a nest, the population is going to be affected. Right? Once they find a nest, they, they collect pollen, they lay eggs in a pollen ball, the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the pollen, the queen feeds them, and we get the first brood of workers. What we see in the spring and the, through the summer into the fall are worker bees. They're much smaller. Um, and they're out collecting food for the colony. The amount of uh, pollen they bring back translates into new bees. So um, they, they're really trying to collect pollen to, to make more workers, and then eventually in the fall, or, or at the end of the cycle, they change from making workers to making queens and males. So the males then, they leave the colony, the males mate with the queens, the queens find a place to overwinter, and that completes the cycle. So they have an annual cycle. Um, nectar is for is their source of energy. It's their fuel. So a bee can live without a bumblebee can live without pollen indefinitely. Um, you know we've we've had them three four weeks just on sugar solution, um, but they can't um, and so um, they can't make newbies without pollen. Um, and if you take away the nectar, they only live for maybe 24 hours. So they really need the nectar as the fuel. But so you can have bees flying around and the population could still be in trouble because they don't have any pollen to make new bees. All right. What I want to point out here is while we're taking care of our managed bees, there are all these points where if we were to reduce the abundance of the bees at the different stages, it's going to affect the population. If we don't give them good overwintering sites, it affects the population. If they don't have nest sites, it affects the population. If the queens don't have food to be able to set up that and put out that first group of workers, we reduce the population. If we don't have a lot of males and queens and they can't find each other to mate, we have reduced the population. So there are all these vulnerable points that we need to think about. And that's just bumblebees. All, like butterflies, everybody has a different cycle. Um, generally it follows the same pattern where they, you know, they need food and they need places if you're a butterfly to lay your eggs. The larvae, a lot of uh, butterflies at the larval stage, like the monarch, specializes on milkweed. No milkweed, monarchs are gone. Um, okay, so so that hopefully that gives you a sense of, of sort of the two sides. And I, I want to point out that both sides are equally important, right? I'm just trying to give you the, the overview of, of what's going on. So when we look at the two faces, the managed bee decline, so the problems with honeybees, um, you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard one out of every three bites of food we take um, comes from a pollinator, right, and comes from a honeybee. Um, because honeybees are, are by far our most important pollinator in an agricultural context, okay? So obviously the bee decline, people are uh, concerned worldwide about the honeybee declines because it's going to have a major social and economic impact, right? We'll have less food on our tables and it's going to cost us a lot more for what's there. And, um, you know, in the case of, of um, you know, bumblebees, if we don't have bumblebees, there are certain crops that are buzz pollinated, only bumblebees do the buzz pollination, the honeybees don't. So they, the bumblebees, the one bum managed bumblebee piece, species has, has a niche. The, um, so if we look at conservation, so we've, this, is, this is what we're faced with in an agricultural context. We've got a lot of one thing in bloom, acres and acres and acres of one thing in bloom. From a pollinator's perspective, this is, you know, couldn't be any better. The whole world is food. Right, um, but what I want to point out is that this doesn't last. Right, so if you're a native bee, a wild bee, you're feeding on this the population. You're like, oh, this is great, this is great, and then it's gone, and you still have months to go, and you need food. Right, so it's this. This is great. So what happens in the at managed bee? You, you truck in your honeybees or your bumblebees, and there are other bees that are um, managed as well. Um, and so if we start to reduce the numbers here. Um, we, we, we don't have enough uh, pollinators to, to give us the crop yield that we want, and we're in trouble. So when we talk about managed bee conservation, we really want to increase bee abundance, right? We want more bees. It doesn't matter what the bees are. And so a lot of the conservation strategies now, when they talk about you know, planting for wild bees, all they care about is that they have enough wild bees or of a wild bee to pollinate the crops. They're not concerned about what I'll talk about in a second, the diversity. They're really focused on abundance. And it makes sense, right? We need to 
we need to uh, get adequate pollination, and if we don't have enough honeybees to do it, we're going to turn to the wild bees to, to do it. And if we find one that does, great, we're happy from an agricultural perspective. But if we turn things and think about more the ecological side, this is where we have to start thinking about both the, the di diversity absolutely matters, right? We've got, as I mentioned, thousands of, of pollinator species. We also have thousands of native plant species that are relying on those pollinators for, for food. And so when we put those two things together, this is sort of pollination biology 101, we've got our, our bees and other pollinators that are using the plants for food. As I mentioned, the, the nectar and pollen is their source. And so when a bee visits, a, this is the typical environment a bee encounters in the wild. So it's got lots of different things available and it has to decide what's the best thing to visit. How am I going to maximize my return in terms of nectar and pollen and time invested? And so the bee may, it goes out and all, all of the, the bees, um, People think that tend to think that insects, because they're so small, are nothing but little programmed robots, right? They smell the, a certain smell and they go after it, or they see a certain color and they go after it, and that's absolutely false. There are, of the thousands of species, probably 5 to 10% are specialists like that. The rest of them do everything based on learning and memory. So 95% of what a bumblebee does on a daily basis is based on its cognitive abilities, its, its brain, um, its, its, its intelligence. They're highly, they're, you know, they paralyze, I, I could go on and give you another talk about, you know, the relationship between bee brains and flowers and why flowers look different, and I'll save that for another day. The point I want to make is that they're relying on their memory. So the bee will come to this environment, it'll sample these and choose the best one. Um, and depending on how good its memory is, it's going to uh, bring back more nectar and pollen for the colony, and that's going to increase the number of mated queens, which is the colony's success, and that's going to affect the population. Okay? We flip things over to the plant side. From the plant's perspective, the ideal pollinator is one that stays and specializes on um, flowers of the same plant species. So obviously, plants can't run around and find a mate, and um, the vast majority of plants are flowering plants, and the vast majority of flowering plants rely on animals to help them to reproduce. And so the plants wanted this bee, so if you're the purple uh, flowered plant species, you want our bee to come visit you if you're this plant, and you want the, the bee the, to then move to the, this purple and just stay within purples. If the bee went from purple to yellow, what happens is, from the plant's perspective, from the purple plant's perspective, pollen is wasted. Pollen is like the male gametes, if they give it like the sperm. So you're wasting your gametes on another plant species, so that's going to be a reproductive cause. If you're the yellow plant species and you're getting purple pollen, what happens is, the, is that the, um, the purple pollen blocks the female reproductive organ and prevents you from getting your own pollen. And that's going to reduce seed set. Okay? So, if we have a bee that decides to forage randomly, <coughs> from the plant's perspective, we're going to decrease population because pollen transfer, if we're staying purple, we maximize. If we're going to switch around, it's going to reduce pollen transfer, <coughs> reduce the amount of seeds and fruit, and that's going to reduce the population from the plant side. So when we put pesticides in the environment, and when bees get sick, it affects their memory. So if the bee decides, and, and typically bees and other pollinators tend to do the specialization, and that's why flowers look so different. They sort of over, they overload the cognitive system of the bee. So they tend to specialize. When we impair their memory, they start to forage more randomly, which is going to affect not just the bee, because it's not bringing back as much food as it should, it's going to affect our plants too because the pollen's being transferred and we're getting reproductive costs. And that's sort of the, the basic uh, premise of the ecological perspective. Now, when we look at that relationship between our thousands of pollinators and our thousands of plants, pollinators, wild pollinators are known as keystone species. That means that their survival has a positive impact on the survival of a whole variety of thousands of other species. Okay. Um, and so we can think about our wild plants as crop plants, but they're not feeding us, they're feeding all the other wildlife that's out there. So we look at the products of, of our thousands of bees and thousands of plant interactions going on. It's supplying food for chipmunks, it's supplying food for birds, supplying nest sites for birds, right, the plant material. Supplying shelter to protect this trophic level from getting eaten by this trophic level. The amount of individuals here feeds the individuals here, and so um, that's, that's the idea of this keystone species. And so what's happening is we're starting to lose our individual pollinator species. At some point we're going to not supply enough food here, we're going to see impacts at this level, and we're going to see what are called cascading effects through the ecosystem. It's going to start affecting our ecosystem health. 
and eventually we're going to remove so many of our native pollinator species, <coughs> we're going to get what's called ecosystem collapse. We're going to see massive reductions in biodiversity. Now, some may say, well, economically, what, what, how's that going to affect me? And in the long run, so there are things called ecosystem services. That is, uh, things we get from nature for free. Pollination is one of them. Decomposition is one. Water purification is one. All of that is a part of a healthy ecosystem. We remove our bees, we start to get ecosystem collapse, um, we are going to pay the price eventually. It's just not as immediate as crop yield, which is something we can see on a yearly basis. This is down the road. The troubling part is we have no clue where we are in that process. We don't know enough about the interaction between to pollinators and plants to be able to predict or, or estimate where we are in this collapse process. But it's certainly not helping when we're putting species on the endangered species list because they have a whole network of plants that, they, that rely on them and you're starting to pull, it's like that game Plinko that where you've got marbles and you've got all those straws. You start pulling out the straws and eventually you're going to pull out the wrong one and all the marbles are going to fall down. And that's what's going to happen to our um, biodiversity. And this is at a global scale. This isn't just, you know, um, restricted to Massachusetts. So, um, so looking at that, taking those ideas now, how do we, what do we need to do in terms of conservation? We need to rethink how our, uh, our conservation strategy from abundance, we have now have to start thinking about diversity. Diversity is the key. We will get the abundance with the diversity, okay? We do not get diversity with abundance. And so this ecological pollinator conservation, we're gonna take into consideration all of these vulnerable points in our life cycle. We're gonna take in the fact that we have thousands of plants and thousands of pollinators interacting that are keeping our ecosystems healthy. And so this ecological pollinator conservation is considering those things. So the nectar and pollen, host plants, all of these things nesting in overwintering sites. When we are thinking about our yard and our gardens, we need to think about all of these things together. And for the rest of the talk, what I, what I hope to do is to, to give you some um, tips on sort of what we need to think about. A lot of there's a lot of information we don't know, unfortunately, and that's part of our ecology project is to fill in the gaps. And my research efforts for, on the you know, pollinator conservation side of things is to try to fill in the gaps, um, you know, looking at pesticides. How does it affect different species? And I'll show you that honeybees may not be affected, but it can kill a wild bee species in two days or three days, the same, the same dose or much less. They're much more sensitive. And, and there's a lot of variation. So this one size fits all approach, this is the complete opposite <coughs> approach. Right? It's trying to get, get away from this idea that, um, that one type of flower is going to service all of these different pollinators. So the other thing that I want to point out before I get into, to, or the first thing that I want to point out, and this is, this is people always, you know, every talk, I've got so many bees in my yard. I've got so many bees in my yard. And I go and check it out, and it's all one species. And I told you there should be 11 there. Depending on where you live, it could, you know, let's say nine if you're low or high elevation. So we, uh, while we have these species, and I showed you this earlier, species in decline, we also have species that are more abundant than they have historically ever been, by far more abundant. Bombus and Patience is one that um, is not only more abundant, but it's starting to move into areas where historically it was never, it's expanding its, its geographic range. And so just to give you, put this in perspective, I went to um, Tower Hill, um, Botanic Garden, I, I work with them and give talks, as was mentioned. So I surveyed in July. I saw 2,000 bees on the property, right? 2,000 bees plus. That's just, you know, I didn't survey the entire property, just, you know, hot spots. All one species. All bombus and patients. I should have seen at least seven at that time. And so it's this... This the idea that if I see bees buzzing around, it's good. You really need to stop and look at the bees. Do I see these different color patterns? If I do, if I see a lot of dip variation, I'm in good shape. If I see one thing, the same thing, <clears throat> I'm not in good shape. And we have to start to think about how we're going to how we're going to change things. Um, okay, so the the idea that you know, there are definitely species that are going to extinction. And the other thing I want to point out is bee loss is different than species extinction. We are not going to get Bombus, uh, Bombus aphanus back. It is headed the way of the dodo, as they say. And it's, it's sad. And we lose, we're going to permanently lose all of those connections. Um, so decline is different than extinction. And that's something that I wanted to point out earlier. 
So what, do we, what, is, what are the stressors that are causing decline? The answer is we don't know, but we have a good idea about things that negatively affect bee health. Some we have a better idea than others. So pesticides, that's all a, definitely, I'm, I'm sure you've heard about the nicotinoids and pesticides and the, the issues there, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and a, a disease. So originally when, we, when I started to observe bees declining, we thought that disease, um, new disease, was really what was causing it. We had good evidence for that. Um, habitat change, so obviously for removing uh, you know, nesting habitat, removing foraging habitat, removing plant species, that's going to have a negative effect. Put up a parking lot, there's not a lot for bee to eat in a parking lot. Non-native species, that's both plants and pollinators, are having a negative impact on our, on our wild bee um, diversity. So, and climate change too. So our lab has been studying all of these things. The climate change is very difficult to, um, to examine the fact, but the idea here is that everything's in sync, right? In the spring, flowers bloom, bees are there, the two get together. Climate change is putting things out of sync. Flowers bloom and go out of bloom, then the bees emerge. They have no food, they die. That's climate change in, in, um, affects it in a nutshell. And there's good evidence uh, in the West, um, in the Rockies, that climate change is affecting, affecting that sink, and people, there are a lot of studies out there that are looking at that. Um, but we're, our research primarily is focused on these other things. And so, the things that we want to consider, um, as I mentioned before, the first thing is that the bee abundance doesn't equal bee diversity. Um, you know, we have increases and decreases. Whatever is causing these, these species to decline, this species is less sensitive to the stressors, and it's either um, thriving under the condition, or because these species are declining, it's just rapidly, it's like opening up a, a niche, or it's giving it more room to move, and it's just expanding um, to, to replace these species that are, that are, that are going to, um, that are declining. Okay, so the first thing that is, the, uh, the second thing that I want to point out is that every species has a different flower preference, okay? We can group things to some degree, but again, this one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work, and it's very, it's pretty straightforward. We have all our pollinators, just look at their tongue lengths. We've got our flies down here, they've got like a sort of a, a tongue that's, that's like a sponge. We've got our bee, it has its tongue it has a hard sheath, and it pulls the sheath apart, so it, it sticks the sheath into the flower, pulls it apart, and then its tongue, the soft part, comes out of the sheath, and it laps up the nectar. And so this is a bee feeding on one of our artificial flowers in the lab. We've got our butterflies. Their tongues are really long, and they can also move them around. Bumblebees can't move their tongues around. They basically are probing with their head. That limits what they can, what they can do. Flies, I mentioned a short tongue. We also have long tongue flies. And if we look at all the different flower shapes, we have a wide variety of flower shapes, right? Um, the nectar is typically located um, at the base, but it can be located in, at the base of a spike, like this, um, and I have other pictures of this, the um, orange touch me not. So what we wanna do is make sure that we have shapes that match our tongue lengths at the basic level, okay? Um, and so we wanna make sure that we have tubular flowers all the way through, because our long tongue bees, so this is a medium tongue bumblebee, some have tongues twice as long, those are the ones that are in decline. Um, and, it's, and, and so we really need to, to provide resources, nectar and pollen resources for our longer tongue um, <coughs> bumblebees. So to give you an, an idea of this fit, I've got some videos just to keep you entertained. So this is our goldenrod. This is Bombus terricola. This was taken this summer. It's one of the ones headed to extinction. Um, we found a population. And so this, you can see that it's just walking around the top. And if I could blow up the, the screen a little bit, you'll see that it was just walking around the top of the flower, sticking its tongue. <coughs> this flower is a very, that's why you see a lot of different types of pollinators on uh, goldenrod, because it's very simple. You land on the flower, you stick your tongue in, you get your nectar. This is toad flax, butter and eggs, uh, Linaria vulgaris, which is a non-native species, the nectar is located at the base of this spur. And so our bee has to come in, pry open the petals of the flower, so it's a closed tube, it has to pry open the petals, crawl inside, and get the nectar. Now, I want to point out that bees learn how to do this. They're not born knowing how to do this. And if we plot how good they are, when they first get to the flower, they're terrible, and then they get better. And you can plot, you can see them learning how to extract the nectar from the flower. Um, so. If we look at the bee here, you can see this is Bombus fervidus, our longest, one of our longest tongue bumblebee species in the state. Um, you can see that it, it, it has this, bumblebees have the strength to press down. A lot of bumblebee pollinated flowers have this closed tube. Honeybees don't have the strength to open those flowers. 
So any native plant with a closed tube is, the honeybees don't like to go in things and they don't have the strength to pry things open. Um, so this is sort of a bumblebee only type flower. Um, so we have our long tongue bees on our tubular flowers, we have our short tongue bees on our short, our, our no tube flowers, our composites. Long tongue bees don't compete well on that type, right? Their tongues get in the way. They're not as efficient. They're outcompeted by medium and short tongue bees. The reverse is also true. Short tongue bees don't have the tongue length to get the nectar at the base of that spur. They go in. And so honeybees are short tongue. And because we have sort of a honeybee focus, all of the seed mixes are short tongue bee species or, or, or um, no tube flowers or composites. And I'll get to I'll get to that in a second. But I just everything you can think of all these different species that they're out there at the same time. They're all competing and. Over time, evolutionary time, they've separated out so that we can have the diversity. They've worked it out over thousands of years. And, uh, and so we can have these things coexisting because they have different traits, either morpho morphological traits, physical traits, like the tongue length, or, or in some cases, behavioral traits. So the fit, just to throw things, uh, a monkey wrench and everything. So I mentioned you know, the long tube. Bombus aphnus, so here's Bombus aphnus. I took this back when Bombus aphnus was extremely abundant on obedient plant, and it's doing its nectar robbing that I talked about. Here is a picture that I took of this summer of a hole. You can see this is what a bumblebee, a hole for Bombus aphnus or Bombus tricola. In this case, it was like the Bombus tricola because I didn't see any aphnus. Um, and comfrey. Carpenter bees also bite holes in flowers, but it's not a perfect circle. It tends to be, they're really sloppy. It tends to be more of a slit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we see our, our, our Bombus aphnus robbing the flower, and here's our Bombus fervidus that's going in legitimately because it has a long tongue and can get in there and get to the, 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 the nectar that's way down here at the base of the tube. And so they've, co they've evolved this system where this, this, is, um, this can be supported. You've got the robbers and you've got the legitimate pollinators. What happens is once the Bombus aphnus bites this hole, other bees learn, hey, I can just use the hole. I don't have to go in the tube. So you've got a honeybee that doesn't like to go in the tube, but when you give it a hole, it'll go and it's called a secondary robber. And so we've got um, other bee species that are using these holes as, as, um, as well to go in and get the nectar. And so we've got this dynamic system. So they have a really short tongue, but they prefer tubular flowers because they bite holes at the base of the tube. And so that's an exception to our general rule that short tongue is short tube type thing. But because these are so rare, uh, this one in Bombus tricola, the one that was in the video, previous video. Um, if you do see a hole, it's exciting. I saw this in Ashfield. That's where I took that picture and I was excited and sent my grad student out there to survey, intensively survey to try to find, uh, hopefully an aphidus. Yeah, sure. What does the bee use to make the hole? Um, so it has mandibles, so it has, um, well, has it yeah, and so, uh, so when bees buzz pollinate, they take their mandibles and they grab onto the flower and then they have this, zzz, zzz, they're able to vibrate their bodies to dislodge the pollen. And so they, they are biting a hole in the, they bite, they bite a hole in the Thank you. You are welcome. Yeah, any other questions as far, far at will? Um, so, um, how is it that we determine, um, flower preferences. Like how do, so yes, there's this general relationship, but each, as I mentioned, each species has its own preference. And what are those preferences? So to figure this out, we've been intensively surveying different areas, as I mentioned, around Massachusetts, the low and high elevation. One of our uh, survey sites is Breakneck Hill in Southborough. Um, and this is just giving you an idea. Here's Breakneck Hill, it's 44 acres. And so every week from June 1st through the first frost, uh, we are surveying, so each one of these lines is where we walk and we um, observe bumblebees and record what we see. And that's how we're, and, and the flower that the bee was visiting, and whether it was visiting for nectar or pollen, and we're putting all that into a big database. And the, the Becology Project, you'll get involved doing this as well. Probably not at this level where you're walking transects. I would love you to, but it's hard to get people to commit to that on a weekly basis, um, especially with, with ticks and whatnot. But um, anyway, so we've been doing it at various sites around Massachusetts. And over the past three years, we've compiled a lot of data on individual bumblebee species. And so what we find is quite interesting. 
So here are all the bumblebee species that we've observed over the last three years. So uh, four, six, eight, nine out of 11, which isn't too bad. Now, some of them we've only seen a handful. Um, so you know, numbers-wise, things are definitely biased in certain directions. Uh, but what I want to point out here is that at Breakneck Hill and our other sites, at one time we may have 25 different plant species in bloom. Okay, and we've got multiple bumblebee species uh, in the in the uh, area that are competing for these resources. So even though we have 25 plant species available, and each one of them has a bumblebee on it, so it has nectar, at at the species level, look at the variation that we see and what they're preferring. So, Bombus uh, griseicolis, it is a milkweed specialist. It loves milkweed. Most of what we saw, if anytime you see milkweed, if you see a bumblebee, it's probably going to be Bombus griseicolis. Um, other species like milkweed as well, but look at Bombus ternarius, which is a beautiful looking bee with, with, with uh, orange. It really likes goldenrod. Um, Bombus impatiens, it's more veg and red clover. Um, uh, uh, another one that was really interesting is um, Bombus uh, vegans and Bombus perplexus really like bush honeysuckle. This is a native bush honeysuckle. And so uh, these dotted lines represent the different. This is short tongue, medium tongue, and long tongue. So not surprisingly, different tongue lengths. They have different preferences. But look, within tongue lengths, we're also seeing really strong preferences for certain plant species. And this was a surprise. So not only do bees match up based on their tongue like they also match up based on some other trait. We think that it's what's in the nectar, um, and we're testing that in the lab right now. Um, but one size doesn't even fit all with when we talk about bumblebees, all that have the same body size and the same tongue length. So they've partitioned out in interesting ways. And so, you know, this is how we're compiling our plant species list for bumblebees. Here's what this species likes. And it's in, even though this one has the same tongue like it likes something totally different. Um, and that's, as I mentioned, I have that list for you at the end. When we flip to, so that was, that was just for nectar. Workers visiting plants for nectar. When we look at pollen, 25 plant species, this was a shock. Only two species, mostly one species, that the bees were actively collecting pollen. So when a bee visits a flower, it gets pollen on its body and it grooms it and takes it back. That's passive pollen collection. Here, when you know, bees are actively collecting pollen, they visit the flower and you hear them, zzz, zzz, they're kicking up the pollen, they're running around the top of the flower really quickly. Um, there were only two. St. John's work by far was um, servicing, was, was the most important pollen plant at our sites and um, was servicing all of these species. Meadowsweet was another important one. Um, we also saw rose and there are, I have a list of pollen plants. As I said, if the bees don't get pollen, they don't make new bees. Bombus fervidus, the one that's in decline, is probably in the state. It's it's over the past three years, it's dropped dramatically in the state. And I was talking to somebody at U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We're going its its status is going to change. I didn't see a single bee with pollen on it, collecting pollen. I didn't see a, a worker with pollen on its legs. So this species is in serious trouble. I have no idea what it likes for pollen, uh, but it was sort of the the um, odd bee out. So we so we not only see differences between species, we see differences in what they like for pollen and what they like for nectar. And again, when we're planting things, if we don't give them both, they're in trouble. So let's look at now, let's take a look at what you go online, you go to Xerces Society, which is a pollinator conservation group, and you, you say, I want a bee, a bee mix. And this is what they give you. And I'm not picking on these two companies, but the, I just Googled bee friendly seed mix, and this is what came up. Look at the flowers, what do you notice? All composites, right? All short tongue bees. <clears throat> Our long tongue bees are losing, and those are the ones that are that don't have pollen on their legs and are, are in trouble. The other thing here is that, you know, and I'll talk about this in a second. The the idea that yes, this looks pretty, and if this if this if the garden looked like this for the entire summer, it would be great. But it's not. This is a you're you're seeing it in a short period of time. And remember, the bee life cycle is from from when we get a thaw to when we get a frost, mm -hmm. they need food. So, um, and different species vary in their um, vary in their preference. The third thing that I want to point out is, whatever you do, avoid planting exotic plant species at all costs. So there are there. Uh, this shows you uh, when we look at whether it was a native or an exotic. There are a lot of species that are preferring um, natives exclusively visiting natives, or sorry, exotics. 
Bombus fervus, Bombus bomaculatus. So the question is, what native plant species is that exotic replacing? Or native plant species plural or, or singular, it's likely plural. Um, so uh, on the other side of things, we have some bees that absolutely avoid the exotic plant species. So when I go into an area and I see what's in bloom, I can tell you what you're gonna see and what you're not, what you're not gonna see just based on whether it's an exotic or a native. And what happens is that in the case of Bombus impatiens and loosestrife, I'll talk about in a second, they have, you think of the exotic as a, as a resource, we're introducing a new resource that only one species gets access to. It's the only one that likes it. What's gonna happen? That species is gonna increase in size, and when that goes out of bloom, it's then gonna increase competition with these species that don't like that exotic species. So it's disrupting the competitive balance. And when you start doing that, one, you're always gonna have a loser and you're always gonna have a winner. And Bombus impatiens is the winner, and all these species are, are losers. Some of the losers aren't, aren't uh, on this graph because um, they weren't part of this study site. So avoid the exotics because they are affecting both the pollinators and the plants. Now let's put this in perspective. Here's Breakneck Hill. Purple loosestrife is an exotic invasive species. I'm sure you're all familiar with loosestrife and wetlands. Here is the loosestrife, the extent of the loosestrife at Breakneck Hill. This is 44 acres. All the rest, goldenrod, dogbane, joe pie weed, all these natives, blue vervain, meadowsweet, all the rest of this. So this is, I think, a quarter or a half of an acre. Nothing compared to everything else. And there's a lot of purple loosestrife in here. I showed you on the previous graph, one bumblebee species, Bombus impatiens, loves loosestrife. And so we wanted to look at, what we did was we went into that area and we removed the loosestrife this year. So we have two years of data, with loose strife, and then we remove the loose strife. Here's what uh, Bombus and Patience was doing before the loose strife removal. So 2016, look at the exotic to native plant species ratio. It was heavily favoring the exotics, and of those exotics, they were almost exclusively visiting loose strife, that small area, and ignoring everything else. 2017 is the red bar. We removed the loose strife. Look at the shift, natives go through the roof. Exotics drop, loose strife, there was still some plants, I and mean, we can't get everything. Um, so there were still some plants, but there was that, uh, just removing what, loose strife alone was enough to shift visitation and pollination to our natives. Look at the benefit the natives are getting. Goldenrod, meadowsweet, blue vervain, dogbane, and joe pieweed all increased. Look at the increase in goldenrod. And there are many species of goldenrod, not, not just one, that were benefiting from this shift. So that just, hopefully that drives the point home that even if you have one exotic, you're thinking, oh, it's not doing too much. I don't have a lot of it. <coughs> this wasn't a lot. And uh, that's the shift. And you can imagine that loose strife is across the state, what it's doing to be um, and native plant um, communities uh, across the state and, and elsewhere. Okay, so the fourth thing I wanna point out is that, and I mentioned this when I showed you the, the figure of the different bee seed mixes, is that the bees need the pollen and nectar at different times of the season. They don't all, you know, they come out at different times in the spring, they peak at different times, and they produce males and queens at different times, and they go to try to find a hibernation site at different times. And this is just showing you, I know it looks like a bit of a mess, um, but it's showing you that the peak abundance, the peak diversity for bees is around June, July in Massachusetts. This is pretty consistent across our, our uh, sites and elevation. Um, there are some species, though, that are more abundant um, later in the season. And so when we're doing our plantings and we're thinking about when do the different species, if a long-tongued species peaks in August, we want to make sure that we have those tubular flowers in August. Um, and when I compile the list, again, that I have for you, when I put that together, um, I took you know, the differences in what's called phenology, which is when we get the, like, what the cycle looks like, um, there's flower phenology as well, as well, so when do the flowers go into bloom and how many of them are there available so we can look at um, how things change over the season. We have different models to look at that as well. Okay, so that's floral resources. Other parts of the cycle, we look at um, nesting and overwintering preferences. So the, the sad news is that we really don't know a lot about the nesting and overwintering. We know virtually nothing about overwintering preferences for bumblebees. And we don't know much about nest site preferences, although some may argue otherwise, but they're arguing based on data, anecdotal data that was collected in the early 1900s about nesting 
for some reason in the early 1900s they could find, it's extremely difficult to find a bumblebee nest. Mm -hmm. I find them because people call me and say, I have a bumblebee nest, I think a bumblebee nest under my deck or in my air conditioning unit. Can you come and get it? And I go and get it, put it in the lab and we study it or we put it somewhere else um, so they can go out and pollinate native plants. Um, we do know that bumblebees are surface and summer surface nesters. So if you have a hay barn, that's ideal for Bombus pervitus, our declining species. Um, I used to go into hay barns and collect four or five colonies from a single hay barn. You see them coming out, you go in with red light so that they don't you don't get stung too badly. I actually haven't been stung that much. That's the, what do I plant in my garden and how many times you've been stung are my top two questions. So you can ask me. It's not as many as you think. I'll give you the answer already. Um, if you're just waiting to ask me that question. Anyway, uh, the other, the, the below ground nesters, they love abandoned rodent nests. So the queens, when they're looking in the spring, I'm, I'm quite sure they're looking for, um, looking for, they could be smelling, uh, abandoned rodent nests. And there are things, bees can see in the UV, there are cues that they're looking for, and I'm going to incorporate that into nest boxes. So there are a lot of bumblebee nest boxes on the market. They are not, don't buy them. They're not worth your time. They have like a 10% success rate, and if they are successful, it's going to be bombus and patients, not one of the rare species. So we need to figure out what the rare species likes, and then we'll build our nest boxes. There are other bee hotels, the ones that have straws in them, or you know, for different types of native bees, those, those are great, and they do work. The bumblebee ones, forget about it. Um, so in our yard, our neighbors aren't going to be happy, but this is sort of what we want. So tufts of grass with dry pockets, that's where the bumblebee queens are looking in the spring. We don't want to turn up our garden too early because the bees are in there hibernating. If we turn them up, you know, we'll either kill them outright or we'll disturb their, their cycle. So we want to wait a little bit. Wood piles. There are a lot of native bees that like to nest in wood. We have, if you have um, bare, bare soil packed down, there are many native bees that like to, 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 uh, to nest in that as well. So, um, so, so those are just some, for bumblebees, unfortunately, like we want to add that to the project, but like, it's just difficult to find them. Um, but that gives you a general sense. If you have a lot of rodents, then you probably are doing, you should leave them because it's good for the bees, but then rodents have their downside too. So, But they are feeding another trophic level, if you want to look at it ecological. Okay, um, so the, the sixth thing um, to consider is, uh, or to not consider, is using pesticides. Um, so neonicotinoid pesticides, um, in the mid-90s, um, it's a new class of pesticide was developed. Imidacloprid was the first one, and there have been several formulations after that. Each formulation is more uh, toxic to insects than the first. So the reason that neonicotinoids are so great from a pest management perspective, um, they're like a wonder pesticide, because all you do is put them in the soil, and they're systemic, which means that you put them in the soil, and then the plant takes them up through the roots and distributes it through the whole plant, and the plant's resistant for the entire growing season. So anything that visits is going to take in the pesticide. And um, sucking insects, feeding on this, neonicotinoids target the insect nervous system. Now, that means that the neonicotinoid, the pesticide itself, has a higher affinity for um, receptors in the insect nervous system, and it overexcites them, and it results in paralysis and, and death. So that's how they work. They have a higher affinity for insects than vertebrates, and that's why they're deemed safe, because you need a lot more of it to hurt a vertebrate. Now, there's data, we have data coming out that there's so much in the environment right now, it's actually having an effect on vertebrates. So, um, so we're past the threshold for the, for the vertebrates. That means that our insects are really in trouble if we're getting to the vertebrate level. Um, the, these, when you spray these pesticides into the soil, um, so from, let me go back, from a pest management perspective, that's why they're around, they're very effective from that perspective. Um, for corn, they treat the seeds, they coat the seeds in the stuff, they plant it in the soil. The problem is that I told you the plant takes it up, it also takes it up and puts it into the nectar and pollen. So, um, so the bees and other things are feeding on contaminated nectar and pollen. It persists in the soil for years after one application. Clothianidin, which is a newer formulation that we've been working with, is in the soil for three years. So people are, find, are, are buying property and finding that their soil is contaminated and they haven't sprayed anything. Um, you know, there's, there's an issue with um, plant stores when you get um, plants that they've actually treated them with neonics, so you're putting them into your garden that way. Um, so there's, you know, a bill going through with this. The other thing that's, um, um, so they, they get in the soil that persists for long periods of time and also they're being transferred 
from the site of application, so from our rose bushes or from our fields here, crops, um, agricultural lands, through surface water or uh, surface runoff and groundwater into natural areas where they are contaminating wildflowers. And there are many studies out there showing that milkweed growing in areas adjacent to um, agricultural lands using pesticides are loaded with neonicotinoids. And so our wild bees, even though they're not in the area and the, and the crop plant is way out of bloom, as they persist, our flowers are contaminated through the whole season and into the next season as well. So that's the problem. It started out as mostly used in agricultural context, but um, use in, um, you know, for your garden or home use, gar uh, parks, urban areas is going through, through the roof. So in the next few years, we're gonna see most of our pesticides being dumped in, um, in urban areas through home use than uh, agricultural lands. So what, you know, so the bees are exposed to low doses of the pesticide for long periods of time. So what? If it's below what the EPA deems kills a bee, then why does it matter? So here we have to differentiate between what's called an acute effect Acute toxicity and chronic toxicity. Acute toxicity is how much does it take the bee have to take in before it dies immediately. Chronic toxicity is it takes in small doses for over an extended period of time and does this lead to death? So we looked at this in bombs and patients. We looked at and most of the testing is done on workers and, and most of it's done on honeybees. None of it's done on wild bees in the corn. Workers, queens, and males. We fed them um, 10, 7, and 5 parts per billion, and then we had our control. So 10 parts per billion is well within field realistic doses. Okay, What do we see? All three of them at 10 parts per billion die, um, but they vary in when they die. So after 5 days, our workers are dead. After just uh, two, 2 or 3 days, half of our male population is dead. And this we're talking hundreds of, like over 100 bees in each treatment group um, for, for queens workers. Queens after eight days. Now, we also notice that seven parts per billion, our males are dying. Half the population after just five days. Queens reduce survival. Workers aren't affected. The honeybee, LD50, it's called an LD50, so the dose that, that kills half the population, is 20 parts per billion. All the testing's done on honeybees. So even if they set it to 20 parts per billion, all of these bees, the queens and the males, are dying. And within bumblebees, if we just use 10 parts per billion as our cutoff and say everything else is safe, what do we see? Our queens and our males are still dying, so our population is going to be affected. Mm -hmm. And this, we need to think about this. Now, if we looked at a different bumblebee species, and if we compare this one to a European species, there's a difference in their sensitivity. Let's look at, and we did, our stable species, bombus and patients, is okay, and a declining species. So our sample size isn't as great here. We found populations that are still healthy. In general, it's in decline. But look at what happens. At, 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 five, or sorry, at 10 and 7 parts per billion, just after two days and three days, our species that's in decline is dying. So we're seeing variation between uh, bumblebee species, and we're also seeing variation you know, when we go from bumblebees to honeybees. So the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't even work for testing neonicotinoids and other harmful pesticides. We really have to, we have to rethink how we're testing these things. And we have to think about diversity. And I know, remember, there are thousands of species. I'm sure that a good percentage of them are more sensitive than what, you're, what I'm showing you here. That what is uh, not acute toxicity in one case is absolutely an acute level in, in uh, another case. There's no question. If you just look at size, that alone is enough to, to push things um, push things in that direction. Okay, so that's that's sort of what you could do um, in your backyard. Now, what can you do sort of in the in the bigger scheme? Um, you could help become a beecologist. So I mentioned this beecology project that we started a few years ago. So what this is a citizen science project. We really need to figure out what those flower preferences and the nesting habits are of the different bumblebee species and other species. Bumblebees. It's easy for people to see them, first of all, and it's easy for them to tell them apart with a, with a little bit of practice. So we're starting with bumblebees, but we want to expand. We're starting in Massachusetts, and we're going to expand to New England and beyond. So to help in the process, we've designed an Android and a web app, Android app and a web app. What you do is you go out and take a five to 10 second video, 
you can freeze frame the video when the bee's in the right position, so a bee on a flower. And then the, the, the app walks you through the identification process, and then you uh, submit it to our database. And so the hope is that we have people across Massachusetts compiling data, and just if, if, if we get people from, from key regions across Massachusetts, in just a couple of years I'd have enough data where we would have a handle on effects of habitat loss, what do we need to put back in our environment. We can, court, we can look at areas where there's heavy neonicotinoid use and show that there's less bee diversity than areas where they don't use these pesticides. There's a lot we can do with, with um, the data. So um, that's... You know, if you're interested, either going out, like getting the app, um, I could, I'd be happy to come back and give a bumblebee ID workshop. We could go walk around. I can show you different bumblebees and how to ID them. We had like a park or conservation land with a lot of things in bloom. Um, you could, you could offer um, or allow us to to survey your land. So if you think you have property that that that's filled with bees and has lots of things in bloom, we could go and survey um, the area and add that to the database. So you don't have to actually deal with the bees, you could just give us access and we'll, we'll, we'll do things for you. Um, and so if you want more information, you can get my, uh, I have my uh, email address on the handout and you can email me. Um, even, if, even if you just take a video of a bee on a flower, five to 10 second video and you send it to me, I can tell you what the bee is with 99% certainty. So, um, you know, the bee on the flower, it just needs to you sort of have to get a top down side view of the bee, but a five to 10 second video of a bee on a flower, I can, I can slow it down, freeze frame it and, and ID it, uh, no problem, if, as long as it sort of... Bees have this stereotypical, when they're visiting for nectar, even pollen, they, they come out and they'll turn before they leave, so if you're videotaping them, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, it's like they know the camera's there, they pose for a split <laughs> second and then they take off. And when, they, when they're posing, that's when I, I capture that frame. Um, all right, so, so our checklist, you know, this summer, you're wondering, do I really have a pollinator-friendly garden or a bee, even a bee-friendly garden, which means I've got hundreds of, of different bee species. We could focus on the bumblebees for now. So the minimal pesticide use, you know, um, that was pretty straightforward. Blooms through the, the season, so we want to think about our bee life cycle. And other things, butterflies too. We want to have plants all the way through the season, not just at, at key times. We want a wide, wide range of different plant species and different types of flowers. And I have, on the checklist, I have the different flower shapes. And if you look at the plant species in the flower shape, you just want to sort of mix, mix and match, um, depending on where you live. And if you have wet, wet soil versus dry soil, you know, you have to do a little bit of planting. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, do I have high pollinator diversity? Um, do I see bees collecting both nectar and pollen? That's key. Um, do we see males and queen bees? Right? We want to see those bees over the entire cycle. So not just workers, we want to see those males and queens. And again, a wide uh, variety of different of, of, of species. And nesting and overwintering sites, this one is hard to tell. I just threw it up there and I'm hoping that you know, when I give this talk two years from now, I'll be able to say, yeah, here's what you need to do for nesting and, and overwintering sites. <laughs> um, so being a ecologist really means that you have to, it's like you're becoming a researcher, right? You are, this is just an example from, um, I got off the web from Jane Sorensen Riverberry uh, Farm, uh, Vermont. You have to list your plant species when they're in bloom, and then you can have different bumblebee species, for example. You can check off the ones that you see uh, through the season, and that will help you to add to your garden the following year, and help you to think about how, would, how might I change things up to, to increase the diversity. Um, and so this, you know, this is throwing in color, but you could throw in different shapes. Um, uh, there as well and, and look for the matches and and you'll notice a pattern and I'm interested in what that pattern is So if you just sent me something like this where you're doing the observations and you were matching up your, your flower shapes with your with your uh, bumblebees um, Or butterflies or whatever um, that would be very useful for us to help to get you know, to understand what's going on with the, with the wild pollinator decline. and so I will finish with um, Just you know, uh, I've already mentioned this just with my email, but as I said, it's on a, on a um, I have it on the handout as well. Um, if you have a garden that has more than six things in bloom, I don't, it doesn't matter if it's an exotic, I'm not gonna come and say, oh, you're all <coughs> filled with exotics. I wanna know if bees prefer exotics because it helps me to show that they prefer exotics over natives and it helps me to make the case. 
So um, whatever you have, it's great. Um, the, the Bumblebee workshop and then the, that five to 10 second video of Bumblebee. If I see one of the rare ones, and, and I'll tell you, I was giving this talk in Ashfield and somebody showed me a picture of Terricola, which is the one that was thought to be extirpated from the state. So gone completely. And we, somebody showed me a picture of that bee. They said, oh, this bee kind of looks like that one in your handout. And I dropped everything and I, we went out and surveyed and we found a population of Bombus Terricola alive and well and we are studying the heck out of it because we want to know what's what like what's missing everywhere else. That's the, the finding one of these and Bombus fervidus, the same thing at Breakneck Kill. The first time I walked through I saw Bombus fervidus. I'm like, we're staying. So any video of a bee that sort of looks different from the other bees you're seeing, send it to me. Because odds are if it's Bombus aphanus, this area has Bombus aphanus. Farther north like uh, north of here, higher elevations, has Bombus tricola. If Bombus aphanus is spotted here, it is huge, a huge deal. So sending that video that you think, oh, it's just another bee, could be the jackpot, right? So, um, you know, I'm sorry, sort of beating a dead horse here, but um, it's just, it's so important that we pay attention to these things. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. And I will get my uh, handouts out. Sorry if I went a bit long. Well, not too bad. Uh, okay. For a while, there's been headlines about killer bees. And yeah. Just what, and they won't make it this far north. They won't. Never. No. Are they still going to be around? No. If you live in areas that don't have a winter, quote unquote, they're still going to be around. If you're here, then you don't have to worry. They can't overwinter. So unless they, they um, even if they, you get a hybrid between a European and the African, um, they, uh, odds are the aggressive part of it's going to be bred out. So it's not a concern. I understand it was kind of, kind of a mistake. They, made, they were oh, yeah. with the bees and yeah. they got roots. They make way more honey than the European bee. They brought them, uh, I think it's a dozen queens to Brazil. And somehow they escaped, and within five years they're in the southern United States. Well, within t five to ten years they're in the southern United States and causing the problem that you see in Arizona and, and places we should be. Well, not we should be, but we we travel to at this time of the year. So, uh, but it's, it won't be a problem here. As far as those bees, if I can say something. Yeah. The bee coordinating a couple of years ago had a video, and a portion of it was about a guy. Obviously, in the southwestern part of the country, beekeeper mm -hmm. never used a suit for his own bees. Yeah. Someone called him. My neighbor has bees. You know, a swarm of bees. Or, or my neighbor has. I've got the bees on my property. My neighbor has horses. They're causing a problem. Can you come and get them out? They were Africanized bees. Yeah. So, so he went to try to pull the wherever part of the house, yeah. the edge of the house apart. The home was absolutely gorgeous. I showed a picture of that. But he soon found out I gotta get a suit on to handle these bees. Yeah, I was gonna ask if he He brought them home, made it out of the he hived them, he keeps them, he doesn't advertise that he's gonna advertise bees. Yeah. He's careful how he works them. Yeah. And they are they are more aggressive, but they are they do make a lot more money and he, he likes them, but he's careful how he works them. Mm -hmm. So they are more aggressive. They will follow further a regular honeybee if you work the nest, the, the, the hive, and they get riled up. They'll follow a certain distance, but then they, they don't. But these guys will follow them. And more of them will follow so them. So if, if a person knows how to handle them and dresses properly. <laughs> yeah, the problem is the feral ones, and you're cutting your lawn, and you yeah, disturb so they're them. Not, they're, they're not around aggressive. here, though. No, they're no, no. no. We don't have to worry about that here. Yeah. Uh, it's called the Becology app, and it's going to be on the Android um, site um, within the next couple of weeks, the, the Play Store for Android. And the iPhone web app version is in the works now, and it'll definitely be ready for the spring. So I have contacts, um, so I've given a fair number of these talks, and I have contacts, and so when that app is ready, I send, I'm sending out the information. But if you wanted to email me, I can put you on the list, and once it's ready, I'm going to send it out if you're an iPhone user. But we also have students working on um, how-to videos for the apps. 
so that everything will be self-contained online. Um, it saves me, I mean, I enjoy traveling around talking to people, and the hands-on is, uh, people pick up the BID much, much quicker, but we have online tutorials and things for the apps and other parts. Yes? I have a dumb question. No, um, you made the distinction between male bees and worker bees mm -hmm. and the queen. So you said the queen is a big one. Mm -hmm. And then how do you know if it's a worker bee or a it's much or male? So the, okay, so good question. Um, so the workers are much smaller than the queens. There's a noticeable size difference. So the queens, as I mentioned, some species, an inch and a half, two inches for the queen. And um, I was going to bring in a colony to show everyone, but I got sidetracked today and I forgot. Um, but the, the queens are the workers are obviously smaller. The difference between workers and males, the, the first of all, the workers sting you. The males don't sting. Their their um, abdomen instead of being pointed with the stinger is squared off, and they have um, these claspers. So they they hold on to the queen and mate with her. And so we see queen. You might see a queen fly around with a small bee attached to it. That's a male flying around. Um, also, the males for a lot of bumblebees have a yellow face and they look fuzzier, and they tend to be they're smaller than the workers. Um, slightly smaller than the workers. So my handout, well not so much my handout, but the app and the MyID workshop, we go through the difference between the males and the workers. But basically if it has a yellow fuzzy face, it's a male. And if it has a shiny black face, it's a, it's a worker. And you the get that really early out in the beginning of the spring there. The queen. The queen, I mean. Yeah. The workers are, so workers and queens are female. Okay. Um, and they are different. Like, I guess it doesn't have to go into that, but the workers and queens are both females, and they're the ones that do all the nest stuff. Okay. The males just go out and find a queen and mate, and then they die. Oh. Um, and nothing survives the winter except for the queen that's been mated. Mm -hmm. Everything else dies. That's the the whole hive. They don't reuse their hive nest sites because of you know disease and things like that. So they have to find a new nest site. The new queens find new nest sites the following year. Okay. Does that? Yep. Like so. There was a kind of bee that likes to go in in wood, like make a hole in your house. And go in that. That's a carpenter bee. So it's 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 they're large, and they're not so, they're not social, so they don't have a colony. They just have a male and a work and a mm -hmm. female. The males have a sh a yellow face. That's the species in this area anyway has a yellow face. It's like a yellow plate. So if you see it head on, and they they tend to look like they're coming after you. They're, they're chasing away other males. And, they're pretty sensitive to that, but they're not going to sting you or anything, even though it seems like it, they're fairly harmless. Um, and then the, 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 the uh, females are just as big. So they, they're the size of a bumblebee queen. Okay. And they're what's digging. If it's a good size hole, that's what's in, in your thing. And they're a nuisance in that way. Okay. But they're still pollinate things. Yep. Um, I have a question about the bumblebee queen. Mm -hmm. Is it the bees are hibernating mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, with a variable weather, like the temperature is supposed to be like 50 on Saturday. Um, yeah. How does that? That's a major problem. Disturb them, or yeah. if, are they like, hey, we can come out now? They. It's exactly what they are. And then, the, so a couple of years ago, remember we had two weeks where it was in the 60s, and then mm -hmm. it dropped down to like 18. Yeah. That absolutely decimated the bumblebee population last year. It was. I would, some species dropped by 90% from the previous year just due to that one event. And so when I talk about effects of climate change, that's what I'm talking about. You get a period where if you get, so if the nighttime temperature is above 40 for about a week, queens start to come out. And then uh, if you get two weeks of that and then they're out, if they're out and you get cold temperatures, they're done for because they, they've lost the insulation just protecting them. Good question. Before you finish, um, yeah. I'd just like to sort of poll the audience to see if people would be interested in an IDP workshop and the library could post something like that. Um, if people are interested, please let us know. It'll probably be in June. It'll be outside.